We're talking about lasting impact. If you guys have a bulletin, you can turn in, in the first page right there in the inside there. And um, it's, it was so good to, to, to hear Clayton bring up the, what he brought up there at the beginning of the service because we're talking about the legacy that we leave, the impact that we make. Um, over This is the fourth week and the last week. Next week, I'm real excited. Um, I haven't really gotten a lot of details about it, but la- next week, we're going to start a new series on marriage and relationships, and it's for everybody. Don't think that if you're not married, it's not for you. I'm telling you, it's for everybody. It's going to be good. So please do your best to come out. But this week, we're finishing up a um, series titled, If I Die Before I Wake. And the whole concept behind this is that we live our life at a pace that tells us that we'll be here for a lot longer than we possibly could. We know that life can be snatched immediately. Our our key text in this uh, message series is Psalm 39, 4 and 5, which says, Show me, Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. You have made the days a mere hand breath. A span of my years is as nothing before you. Everyone is but a breath. Even those who seem secure. And Ecclesiastes 8.8 8, talk about uh, you know, us trying to control the wind and how impossible it is to control the wind. At the same notion, as as impossible as it is to control the wind, it is just as impossible for us to control the day or the time. We don't have a power of any kind over the time of our death. We don't. We talked about just living right now, doing right now, living for right now. We talked about our treasure. We talked about living for what lasts. And last week we we talked about fighting for peace. Um, We need to fight. We need to fight. In that we we said we need to confront humbly. We need to love deeply and forgive irrationally. We need to confront humbly, love deeply, and forgive irrationally. What are we fighting for? Church, what are we after? Are we fighting for, what are we fighting for? We're fighting for peace. We're we're fighting for, as, as the Bible so clearly lays out for us, we are ambassadors that are to bring the message of hope and truth to a world so lost. We are here as those who, who, who preach the message of reconciliation. And so this morning we talk about lasting impact. What will I leave behind? What will I be known for? And I've noticed in my own experience in those that I've done funerals for in family members that have been with in the loss of someone they love so deeply, it's not always what they did that they're remembered for, but the content of their character. It's not just what they did, but who they were. Who they were, the, the, the people they were, the person they were. What will you be known for? Our convictions need to be unchanging, and those convictions need to release from within us something real. In 2 Corinthians 3.3 3 it says, You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of a living God, not on tablets of stone, but on the tablets of human hearts. And, and this morning, all eight of them are going to be right up there. So you guys, you guys can take notes with me, but what will you be known for? What will you be known for? And I know that eight seems like a lot, but I just, I, you know, like, like, like when, when I was thinking about this message, when I was, when I was praying about what God wanted me to share, when I was, when I was thinking about this, I, I just kept, you know, I had to take a few off because I kept teetering back and forth. Should I add this? Should I put this? Should I, because I want us as people who serve Christ to be known and remembered for not just what we're against, but what we're for. We, we live in a culture that Makes that distinction. Sometimes Christians are more noticed for 
what we're not allowed to do or what you're not supposed to do, what we're against. Oh, well, you know, if I go to church, then I can't. I'm not allowed to anymore. I, I got to do this and I'm supposed to do that. But we've got to begin to live in a way that when we're gone, when we've left this planet, when our human existence here on earth is gone, what will people remember us for? What will they remember us for? Purity. I sure hope so. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What will you be known for? And a lot of people right now, when they think of purity, they automatically think of sexual things. But I want to include also the purity of our character. Noble actions. That we can go to bed at night with a clean conscience because we're not being deceptive. We're not being manipulative. That we are actually living a pure life that our heart and our actions and our intentions and our motives are pure. What are we going to be known for? Purity? Are people going to notice us as someone who stands out, that we're for purity, that in a world full of trash and filth, that we stand separate? I was reading a statistic just the other day, and this is crazy to me, but we, we've been fighting to abolish slavery. We've been fighting to abolish it, that equality is something that every human being has. Do you know that we are living in a time where there are more slaves than ever in our world? And that extends to all different places. What will we be known for? What will we fight for? Will we fight for purity? Will we, will we be known for the pureness of our relationship, our speech, our actions, our motives? Will people know us by our respect? 1 Peter 2.17 says, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Many of us feel like in our country that we've been provoked, that our, our, our rights, our privileges of living in a free country have been removed from us. How will we respond to that? Will we respond in self-righteous arrogance or will we respond with respect? It makes a huge difference how you respond. Every human being is special, regardless of whether or not we agree with their choices. Every human being is precious, has meaning. Do we respect every human being? And we're all guilty of this, not just Christians, but we tend to, the world tends to demean those who don't stand in the same place as, 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 as you do. We, 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 we position ourselves in a place when we see others that don't agree with us. And we sometimes, whether intentionally or not, we demean them because they're lesser than us because they're not where we are. Every human being is precious and deserving of respect. Can you imagine the kind of impact we would have as Christians if we treated every person, regardless of their decisions in life, with the utmost respect, even those who disrespect us, even those who laugh in the face of our hope and our truth, even those who push back and disrespect us because we go to church and we love Jesus. Will they be known for our commitment? Matthew 5, 37 says, all of you need to say, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Commitment shows one of our greatest attributes as a believer. When you promise to do something, do it. I'm telling you guys that I've impacted many people's lives. People that don't even attend a church anywhere when they've reached out and said, Hey, I, I, I got a need. Can you, can you, can you help me? Can you, can you be a part of the solution? Can you, can you just do something? And I've kept my commitments. I, I'll be honest. I've not been perfect. There's some that have missed. None of us are perfect, but we should do with our best effort to keep our commit, our commitments. 
Of course we fall short. But what are people going to notice? Oh, those, those, those Christians, man, they're shady. They promise help, but then they, they run off as soon as they can. Or are they going to notice that when we say, yeah, I'm there for you. Yeah, I'm going to do something for you. Yeah, I'm going to support you, that you're right there with them. Will they be noticed for your sacrifice? John 3, 16, one of the most beautiful verses in all the scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will or shall not perish, but have eternal life. That sacrifice, that was his son for your life. His perfect son, his spotless son, his son that did nothing wrong, that deserved no punishment. Put on a a form of capital punishment. We see the cross in a different way this day, but the cross was a brutal instrument And that brutality was exacted on our Savior. He was willing to sacrifice himself over 2,000 years ago. And sacrifice, I'm telling you guys, sacrifice might feel like loss, but I assure you it's gain. We know that the scripture says this, and we know that this is one of the things that I've shared in this church many times. It is more blessed to give than it is to receive. You will find that over and over and over again. When you sacrifice, God will move in substantial ways. It is incredible what you feel, what you know to be true. What will they know you for? What will the world know you for? Well, they know you for your selflessness. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. It doesn't say certain people look to their interests above yours. It says value others. Others. Value others. Uh, Andy Stanley said it this way. I love this quote. Whoever devotes themselves to themselves in the end will have nothing but themselves to show for themselves. <laughs> Whoever devotes themselves to themselves in the end will have nothing, to, nothing but themselves to show for themselves. Will we be known for our selflessness? Will we be known for our kind acts? Will we be known for a people that stands separate because we've given selflessly? Patience. Galatians 5.22 says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. I mean, there's so many captured in that. In today's fast-paced, drive-through, entrepreneurial world, patience is key. I'm telling you, some of the greatest Character development in my life has happened in the wait. In the moment in between. In the moment of, this is what I'm going to do, and the moment when it's finally realized. Will we be known for our patience? We can be so impatient. We want to speak into people's lives. We want to sow seed and say, all right, and literally shake them into the kingdom. And I'm telling you, sometimes we've just got to be patient and wait. They'll come along. Continue to pray. Continue to be there for them. As Clayton mentioned this morning, you know, we, we know that one of, one of the areas that we struggle most with patience, especially as believers, is when people don't get it right with their habits and their addictions and they just keep moving on into that realm, into that place, doing things they shouldn't be doing, living in ways they shouldn't be living, and we can get so frustrated. Come on, when are you going to get it right? When are you going to stop drinking so much? When are you going to stop snorting that stuff? When are you going to stop shooting that stuff up? When are you going to deal with this addiction? When are you going to stop looking at porn online? When are you going to stop doing this stuff? When are you going to get it right? Do you realize how patient he has been with you? Come on. We in this culture, in this instant culture, need to stand out. We want change now, but it takes time. We'll be known for our grace. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. God has covered a multitude of sins. God has released those things from us. Jesus continues to extend a helping hand regardless of our situation. Will we be known for our grace? 
will be known for our forgiveness. Betrayal is brutal and it's hurtful and it's horrible. But will we stand out from a world that seeks revenge? Will we stand out from a world that seeks to hurt someone who's hurt us? To respond in, in envy and rage and jealousy? Or will we be known for a people who go to someone and extend grace and forgive? I mean, that's just ludicrous to some people in this world. I've heard stories of murderers who have had people come to, to their, their, you know, those that they, the families that they've attacked that come into their, their prisons and start speaking to them, start talking to them, start telling them, I forgive you. I forgive you. I'm going to extend grace to you. Will we be known for our love? 1 John 4, 8 says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Love is an intrinsic value for any who call themselves a Christ follower. In fact, I would even doubt the credibility of faith in someone's life if they did not have the love that he had for us dwelling in them. And that love will carry you to some hard places That love will carry you to some places that are messy, some places that are challenging. As I shared with you guys last week, this bride, this this beautiful church is a messy place. But let's all get together, and though we're getting it wrong sometimes, a lot of the time, let's work towards what God has designed for us to be. We've gotten to this place where we feel like the church needs to be perfect and it needs to be right. And, and we do some things that, that some people say, well, I'm just, I'm just kind of bouncing around and looking for the church that meets my needs. Hey guys, the church was never intended to meet your needs like that. We are a people. This is just a building. If this building ceases to exist, if this building were to burn down, would we still have the love that we have amongst each other? Would we still be the church? Absolutely, we would still be the church. Because that's a people, not a place. And that love needs to be expressed in our life. That love needs to be seen and felt and known and experienced. Love will lead you to messy places. Will they know what you're for? more than what you're against? Will they know who you are? When, when, when you're long gone, who will people remember you as? Will they see you as someone who's pure, with someone as full of respect and commitment and sacrifice, selflessness? Will they see patience in you and grace and love? Will they see those things in you? Will they see those things in you? Will those things be a part of your life? Now, right there in your notes, I give you an opportunity to write down one more that you think is important. You can do that now or on your own time. But seriously, like we are living in a culture right now, in a world right now, where Christians are known more for what they're against than they are for. And we need to start loving people and not be afraid of how messy and ugly and personal it'll get to be okay with that. Hey guys, I got news. You're going to offend each other. I'm going to offend you. I'm going to hurt your feelings every once in a while. You're going to hurt my feelings every once in a while. What do we choose to do with that? This is a messy place. This is a family. I, 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 I taught a message to a group of, of a bunch of church kids. Um, <laughs> They can be the hardest sometimes. Um, a bunch of church kids that was titled The Church. The place for the greatest dysfunctional family. But guys, if we let his love lead, if we let his grace lead, if we have these things, if people know us for who we are, we're going to move past that stuff. People are going to see us as somebody different. They're not going to see us as dysfunctional. They're going to see all the things that might not be going right in our life and notice that something so true and so real is happening, is being born in that. They're going to want to be a part of that. They're going to want to know that. How can they love each other like that? The things that they've done to each other. Things that have happened among them. How can they still go on? How can they still move on? How can they still press on past that? Because we have Christ in us and his character and his traits and who he is living in us. What will we be known for far after we're gone? 
want to say three things to you real quick, and then we'll close. Number one, say what you need to say. Say what needs to be said. Now, not later. Not in a few weeks. Now. I mean, like... Say what needs to be said. Proverbs 4, 20 through 24 says, My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. This is Solomon imparting some wisdom to his son. He's saying, hey, 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 pay attention. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what I'm speaking of. Listen to what you hear right now. Do not let them go out of your sight. Keep them within your heart for your, for they are life to those who find them and health to the one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Other parts of the Bible say that our speech should be there to build people up, to encourage one another, to increase value and life and maturity, not by pointing out and targeting things that might be wrong with them, by pointing out hope, speaking truth, speaking who they are over what they did. Isn't that what Jesus tells us? Say what needs to be said. This is converting positive thoughts into positive words. Uh, You need to think about this. Above all else, here's what I want you to know. I want you to think about who that is. Uh, Say the words that need to be said. Some of us have been stalling for some time. We have a family member, someone we love, someone we've had a, a fracture in relationship with, and we've waited too long. And it's time to speak up because you don't know you could pull out of this parking lot today and be gone. Don't wait till someone's deathbed to make things right. Don't. Don't, 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 don't. And not just that, but, man, you know, like, those of you who have children, even adult children, man, speak to them frequently. Build them up. Release the positive thoughts that you have of them, how how blessed you are by them, how encouraged you are by them, how wonderful they are. I know that kids have not always gotten it right, and it can be hard, because sometimes they frustrate you. But don't hesitate. Don't wait, because you might not realize that your opportunity is narrowing every day. Hey, guys, it may not be today, and it may not be tomorrow, but what I do know is tomorrow you're a day, close, day, a day closer to the day you die or the day he returns. Say what needs to be said. Say the words that God wants you to say. Allow your speech to, to, to just launch out there. The Bible says that the tongue has the power of life and death. And we in our culture, in our world, in, in, in what we're seeing in social environments, especially online, it so clearly is that our words are powerful. And they can change lives. They can change directions. They can steer a person towards hope or they can steer a person towards defeat. What words will you say? Say what needs to be said. Say what needs to be said. And don't wait for tomorrow. Create an opportunity as immediately as possible to say what you need to say. Some of us have 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 been living in, in dysfunction in our families And we'd rather it be what we have than have to scrape all the crud from under the carpet and deal with it. But I'm telling you, leaving it the way it is is not peaceful. You gotta deal with it. You gotta get that junk out. You gotta handle it. You gotta address it. You gotta move forward with God. You need to say what needs to be said. If I could tell you the amount of times that I've come in contact with people who have wished, just wished that they would have said what needed to be said before it was too late. Number two, do what needs to be done. Acts 20, 24 says, however I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying the good news of God's grace. Do what needs to be done. Do what needs to be done. 
What's your unfinished assignment? That's a question I want to ask you right now. What is your unfinished assignment? What have you yet to accomplish? What person out there is yet to be told the truth about what's in this book? Who have you been fighting the urge to say, okay, I've got to talk to this person about Jesus, but I know they're going to push back. I know they're going to laugh at me. I know that they're going to insult me. They're going to push back. But what unfinished business do you have? You need to do what needs to be done because you don't know. Some of you in this room have experienced the reality of how brief life can be. And it's time now to do what needs to be done. It's time now. Do what needs to be done. What unfinished business do you have in your life? You know, write it down. Put it somewhere on this page. Write it down. What, 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 what is left? Where, where, where do I go from here? What do I do from here? What unfinished business? I need to do what needs to be done. Right now, I need to decide and not just decide on it and think about it in this service, but as you leave this place, to write it down, to jot it down, to put an asterisk or whatever you need to do to remind yourself, today is the day. This is the week. No more waiting. No more stalling. No more stalling. Number, th- number three is live the life I was made to live. James one twenty two. I love James. Definitely a book you read with self-reflection. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. First John 2.17 says, the, the world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And 2 Timothy 4.6-8 says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering. And the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do what needs to be done. And and, and number three, live the life that you that I was made to live. It's time to live the life I was made to live. It's time to live the way you were made to live. Hey guys, it is never too late to start living the way God designed for you to live. Some of us, man, we mess up, we make mistakes, and we feel like we have lost it. We, 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 we've, we've left the opportunity. It's far behind us now. There's no chance whatsoever that we'll be able to ever exist in the place that God wants us to exist in. And it's just not true. If you still have breath in your lungs there is purpose in your life I have talked to people before who have found themselves in hospitals and wondered what is the point of this I'm going to be gone soon and the impact that they've made in the last moments of their life in an emergency room or in an ICU unit as they speak the truth to others have been absolutely astounding live the life you were made to live and it's not it's never too early it's never too late you guys have heard me share about randall randall was this beautiful boy who was merely 13 years old when he lost his life epilepsy had taken control he was gone. I mean, we, we thought we had him. We, we were seeing miracles. We were seeing substantial things happen. And, and we were seeing beautiful things uh, out of a surgery that was just impossible. And one night, he just, he had a seizure one night and choked to death. And that was it. And in 13, this kid lived the life he was made to live. Because I'll never forget, I mean, we're standing at the front of the sanctuary and, 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 and it's that time and we're closing Randall in the casket. It's, it's, it's becoming real and it's apparent and I lost it. I lost it. I mean, I began to weep and cry and his mother pulled me alongside herself and she said, you know, God took him because his work here was done. He had completed his task. Randall did not wait to live the life he was made to live. 
He started living that life as soon as he could articulate in his young mind who God was and who God had designed him to be. The strange thing is, is though 13 Randall had the mentality of a six or seven year old, if we can, as six or seven years old, articulate that God has designed something special and specific and begin to live in that, why do we grow out of that? I know life catches up. I know it gets hard. I know it gets overwhelming, (laughs) but it's never too late to live the life you were made to live. Things might have interrupted. That kid might be coming before you thought they were going to come. You you might have thought, you know, I I intended to go to college and I intended to do this way and I I was going to go this way and, and things just got kind of messed up and and you know here I am all of a sudden you know nearly 40 years old or 50 years old or 60 years old and I don't know what I'm going to do or you know I'm in my mid-20s and and I mean we're just kind of like existing every day I don't know what to do it is never too late to start living who God has called you to be and this, this position right here is just one of the facets of ministry all of us are called to do his work all of us Every single one of us have an opportunity and you will not be happy. You will not be joyful. You will not experience the fullness of who God is until you step in the fullness of what he has designed for your life. You might be afraid. Well, I don't know if I want to walk in God's will because I'm going to be miserable. It's going to be hard. It's going to be frustrating. It's going to be overwhelming. I'm telling you right now, regardless of how hard and frustrating, overwhelming it is, when you walk in God's way of life, There's no better place to be. No better place. As we close up this series, I want to ask you guys to do something. I have a couple questions or a couple couple challenges. You can read them up there. This first one is, I want you guys to make a list of whom you most desire to impact with your life. Beside each name, you need to write out what you want to say by completing the thoughts. Above all else, here's what I want you to know and set a deadline to share with them. You may want to write a letter. You may want to write a letter to your spouse. You may want to write a letter to your kids. You may want to, you, you may want to write a letter because you don't know. There are things that this, I mean, this is a, a, affected and impact me. There are things that I want my two, nearly two year old girl to know before I'm gone. Maybe I need to write a letter just in case. Guys, you just, you don't know. We don't know. Hey, uh, write down some names and write down what they need to know. Write down what they need to hear. It's time to speak up. It's time to say what you should have said a long time ago. It's time to stop stalling. I know that it can be scary. I know that it can drive knots in the pit of your stomach. And it can cause all other kinds of anxiety. Being so afraid to finally release it. But I also know the freeing experience of releasing it. When it's finally said, you're like, oh, why didn't I do that sooner? Secondly, complete this thought. I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may. Write down three things you know God wants you to do with your life and start praying regularly that God can accomplish those things in your life. Through you? What steps do you need to take to follow through with them? Who is God calling you to be? Some of you in this room, you might be terrified, like, what if he sends me to Uganda or something? So be it. Some of you in this room, God's going to speak to you, and he's going to say, I've called you to be a mother and a grandmother. And you're to do that with everything inside of you, because what you impart to these children will change the world. Uh, changing the world starts with changing diapers, as far as I'm concerned. I, I mean, I know that, you know, like, I hear some people say, oh, you know, your kids are so great and so wonderful and so amazing. And, and I mean, I, I have so much credit to give to my wife for that. And we don't get it right all the time. We argue in front of them. It happens. What has God called you to be? Some of you, it might be something big, and you've been <clears throat> fighting it. When I was finishing up high school, I was, I was like, I'm not going into ministry. I'm done with that phase. You know, I felt like for a long time I was called to ministry, but I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm going to 
I'm going to hold my own road. I'm going to go my own way. And thankfully, God alerted me. God pulled me back into where I needed to be. And I stepped back into his design, his will for my life. And I've talked to Kelly many times over when we faced rough experiences. Have you ever just thought about walking away? And she's looked at me and said, you'd be miserable. Because this is where God wants you. Write it down and start praying that God opens doors. With that, though, know what you're praying for. And last, ask the Lord to show you areas where you are not currently living as he called you to live. Surrender these areas to him and invite the Holy Spirit to live through you. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit when he comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This was a promise of Jesus as he was ascending into heaven, that his Holy Spirit would come into us to empower us to live as we should. And that's a promise that's still available today. It's still an opportunity at this moment in time. All four weeks of these, if you've not been able to, to, to be here every Sunday, I would encourage you to get online. All of, our, all of our messages are online on YouTube. I can get you information. It's right there on the bulletin if you need it. But I would encourage you to follow up, to watch these four messages and allow them to create a, a point in your life where you say, okay, enough is enough. I mean, in our, in our second week, we watched this, this man who suddenly contracted, didn't know it all, contracted ALS. And then all of a sudden, his life was radically changed. And his children and his wife would suddenly be without him. And what he wanted them to know. I don't want to scare you this morning but you don't know how much time you have left. And as far as that, not just this, the understanding of, of death, where we stop breathing, but the Bible says that no one knows the time or the hour that he will return. You just don't know. And that shouldn't cause us to live in fear. That should cause us to passionately pursue whatever he has for us. And I cannot over iterate this. God has so much for you. So much. If only you would surrender to him and let him do what he can in you. If I die before I wake, some of you, you're going to make decisions over the next few hours this afternoon. You're going to make choices to do something before you even lay your head down on your pillow tonight. And I'm going to tell you that you, you, you may fear that your rest won't be, won't be any better. But I'm telling you, your conscience will feel better because you finally stepped up. You finally did it. You finally engaged. You finally said, okay, God, I'm yours. You finally said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. Say what needs to be said. Do what needs to be done. Live the life he made you to live now. Stop waiting for this evident. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, as Jeremiah 29, 11 speaks of. And we wait for something that's going to happen in the future. And we forget what's happening right now in front of us, right now in the immediate moment of our life. God is telling you this morning, and I know that it feels like I'm, it feels like I'm pushing and pressing on this, but I just want you to grab this, that he has something for you today, not tomorrow, today. Snatch it. Take hold of it. Take hold of it. If I die before I wake, will you go to bed tonight knowing that you did everything that you should have? And I don't want this to feel, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I'm sorry if you feel guilty. I'm trying to convict. I know that I've been convicted. I got to do better for my kids. I got to do better for my wife. I got to do better for my affection for all of you. And God has really just grabbed a hold of me and said, Seth, what happens far after you're gone? Will you make a lasting impact? 
I hope that my life leads back to him. And I'm going to pray for that same thing for your life as well. Father, we thank you so much for today, God. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that you have spoken to our hearts, God. Challenge us today. Lord, I pray that we would not feel overwhelmed, God, by this. Lord, that we would just start doing one thing at a time, that we might feel like it's a small thing, a little deal, but it's a big deal. God, that we would speak and communicate. God, that we would be known for what we're for more than we're known for what we're against. God, that we would allow the things that are true, the things that are pure, the things that are lovely to to just begin to emanate from our life. That we would be recognized for those you have dwelled within, that your Holy Spirit would begin to lead and guide us every single day. Jesus, that we would indeed become ambassadors, that we would speak of the reconciliation we can have, that others can have, that today we would choose to to say what we need to say, to do what we need to do, and to live the life we were made to live. Today, not tomorrow, today. It's in Jesus Christ's wonderful, precious, and beautiful name we pray these things. Amen.